Hi, my name is Alyssa, and this is Medicine, where learning is always in style. Today, we'll be talking about cardiac action potentials. By the end of this video, you will have a basic introduction on the following topics. Conduction system of the heart, action potentials of pacemaking and non-pacemaking cardiomyocytes, and channels involved in cardiac action potentials. Before we start, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, follow our Instagram, at MedicineStyle, for more content on life as a med student and study review. Okay, let's start with some vocab. Membrane potential is a measure of the electricity across a cell's membrane, most simply calculated as the difference in electrical potential between the inside and outside of the cell. Action potentials are the electrical messages sent between cells that result from large fluctuations in the membrane potential of a given cell from a rhythmic flow of ions. Action potentials are all or nothing, which means you either have a full one or you don't have one at all. There is no such thing as a small or big action potential. Threshold potential refers to the membrane potential at which an action potential is initiated, which represents that all or nothing point. To depolarize means to increase the membrane potential, to hyperpolarize or repolarize means to decrease the membrane potential. Generally, a cell becomes more active as it depolarizes and more inhibited as it hyperpolarizes. Very few cells in the body can initiate action potentials. The hallmarks of these include pacemaker cells in the heart, cardiomyocytes, and neurons. Today, we will focus on the heart. Let's look at the electricity of the heart as a big picture first. The heart is one big muscle. Like any other muscle in the body, it contracts in response to electrical activation. The conduction system of the heart is a specialized collection of cells that rhythmically depolarizes to initiate cardiomyocyte contraction, which leads to the pumping of blood through the heart. In the normal heart, electrical impulses begin in the SA node, or sinoatrial node. This impulse travels through the internodal branches to the AV node, from the AV node, the signal is propagated through the bundle of His, the right and left bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. The depolarization initiated by the SA node leads to atrial contraction. The depolarization initiated by the AV node leads to ventricular contraction. Unlike most muscles in the body, the heart muscle does not require direct neural stimulation to contract. The SA and AV nodes are made up of pacemaking cells. These cells are intrinsically programmed to beat at a regular rate. The SA node has an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute, and the AV node has an intrinsic rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. Therefore, if the SA node fails, the AV node may initiate ventricular contraction, albeit at a slower rate. It's also worth noting that the nervous system can cause acute changes in heart rate. For example, the sympathetic nervous system speeds up your heart rate while you work out. However, this nervous system input is not required for the heart to beat at baseline. Okay, now let's go into the physiology of it all. There are two types of cardiac action potentials. Those that occur in the pacemaking cells of the heart, like the SA and AV nodes, and those that occur in the non-pacemaking cardiomyocytes, which contract to propel blood. You wanna think of the pacemaking cells as the leaders who send out orders as to when the cardiomyocytes should contract. The cardiomyocytes follow these orders as probably the most cohesive team to ever exist. They work together, so let's learn about them together. The action potential of the pacemaking cell has three phases. Phase zero, phase three, phase four. This might sound like someone forgot how to count, but just follow me for a second. The action potential of the non-pacemaking cells include phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Let me show you. Let's start with the pacemaking cells. In phase zero, the pacemaking cells reach the threshold potential and the rapid all or nothing depolarization phase of the action potential begins. In phase three, the pacemaking cells hyperpolarize to below the threshold potential. And during phase four, pacemaking cells gradually depolarize to reach the threshold potential and begin firing another action potential all over again. The pacemaking cells signal the cardiomyocytes to begin their own depolarization and subsequent muscle contraction. In phase zero, the cardiomyocytes reach the threshold potential and rapidly depolarize. This causes the cardiomyocytes to actively begin contraction and propulsion of blood out of the ventricles. 
In phase one, there is a brief moment of initial hyperpolarization, followed by the plateau of phase two. This plateau represents the sustained contraction of the cardiomyocytes to ensure maximal expulsion of blood from the ventricle. In phase three, the cardiomyocytes rapidly hyperpolarize to reach the resting membrane potential of phase four, and the cycle repeats. When we put these action potentials side by side, you see how they are perfectly timed. The pacemaking cells have a prolonged phase four to wait for complete ventricular contraction before initiating the next beat, while the cardiomyocytes have a prolonged phase two plateau to carry out complete ventricular contraction. This coordination allows the cardiomyocytes to fully contract and push the blood out of the heart while beating with regularity. Now let's discuss the ions and ion channels that make all this happen. Remember that action potentials are a matter of electrical changes across a cell's membrane. That means that changes in ion concentrations on either side of the membrane are the electrochemical mechanism by which action potentials occur. In the pacemaking cells, phase zero occurs when voltage-gated calcium channels open and allow an influx of calcium into the cell. At the peak of the action potential, calcium channels close and potassium channels open. This leads to phase three, when potassium leaves the cell, which is known as potassium efflux via voltage-gated potassium channels. This leads to hyperpolarization of the cell. Finally, the funny channels open during phase four to allow for the slow depolarization of the pacemaker cells towards the threshold potential. These funny channels, also known as HCN channels, allow for influx of sodium into the cell. These channels only open when the cell is hyperpolarized and a membrane potential of negative 50 millivolts. In the cardiomyocytes, phase zero occurs with the opening of voltage-gated ion channels that allows for the influx of sodium into the cell. During phase one, these sodium channels close and potassium channels open. These ions transiently efflux or leave the cell, leading to a transient hyperpolarization. Soon, however, voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium simultaneously enters the cell. The hyperpolarization from the potassium efflux and the depolarization from the calcium influx leads to the plateau of phase two, during which time the cardiomyocytes sustain ventricular contraction. The calcium channels finally close and the voltage-gated potassium channels remain open during phase three to allow potassium efflux and overall hyperpolarization of the cardiomyocyte. Finally, during phase four, the potassium rectifier cells maintain the resting potential until the pacemaker cells trigger the cardiomyocytes to begin the cycle again. Here's a quick reference for the ionic flow during each phase of the action potentials. By now you should realize that the pacemaker cells and cardiomyocytes must be intimately connected to pull this whole thing off. The pacemaker cells initiate the contraction, but the cardiomyocytes must respond in synchrony to actually pull this off. We can thank electrical synapses or gap junctions for that. The heart is the only location in the human body with gap junctions. These are essentially holes in the cell membrane of two adjacent cells that allows the cytoplasm of both cells to be shared. This leads to an incredibly quick propagation or spread of the action potentials across all the neighboring cardiomyocytes. This can be up to 20 times faster than the rate of communication between neurons, which have chemical synapses instead of electrical ones. Such instantaneous spread of the action potentials leads to a synchronized contraction of the myocardium with every heartbeat. In summary, the conduction system of the heart is the electrical system that triggers myocardial contraction. There are two types of action potentials within the heart those in the pacemaker cardiomyocytes, and those in the non-pacemaker cardiomyocytes. All the cells of the heart are connected intimately via gap junctions to allow for a synchronized contraction of the myocardium. That's it. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, follow our Instagram, at MedisonStyle, for more content. My name is Alyssa, and this is Medizin, where learning is always in style.